Hi everybody and welcome back to lecture today. Um, we're going to be focusing on our final week of specialty inmate topic, topics as I, I um, promised. And today we're going to focus on sex offenders and the elderly. Also included in this week's discussion is the topic of mental illness and mental health offenders. Um, but as I suggested to you the last time, um, that we focused on this already when we talked about solitary confinement, so I'm going to focus less on that and more on the other two offender groups. Um, so what I thought I'd do is start off by talking to you guys about elderly inmates, um, and then we're going to end the lecture by talking a little bit about the incarceration experiences of sex offenders. So in talking about the elderly, as you probably can imagine, um, prison is just a stressful thing for anyone to have to, to endure. To spend a significant time in your life, whether that's a year, five years, ten years or more, in prison is very stressful. You're worried about the family and the friends that you have left behind. All of those individuals, their lives are carrying on without you and you're not part of it. You're missing significant milestones in your child's life. Um, you're on the inside and you're very worried about your own safety you're worried about um, how you're going to navigate the, the stressful um, parts of prison life, how to avoid getting um, beaten up or anything by other offenders. It's just a lot that you have to process every day. Um, and, and not only that, but you're just losing significant chunks of your own life. Being anywhere out of a community for a year, five years, ten years, like we just said, is is so hard there's just so much happening out in the world and it's like your life is standing still and then when you go back out into it how do you navigate this environment that you have just left behind for these this significant amount of time so it's stressful to say the least right and whenever we have more stress in our lives that stress compounding day after day after day um, it ages us faster and faster regardless of whether we're in prison or we're on the outside um, but prison just seems to do it a little bit faster for us. So inmates who are going into prison often take a variety of different medical um, concerns, conditions, diseases, what have you, into the incarceration setting um, that they're going into. And not only that, but they're still continuing on with their vices while they're incarcerated as well. Um, so if you think about it, smoking still happens. Um, if you're still in a smoking setting or a, smoke, a prison that allows you to smoke, um, cigarettes are often used as a bartering system or a form of currency among inmates. The idea of prostitution, um, other high-risk sexual behaviors, sexual assault in prison all still occur and have an impact on your life, your safety, your ability to function while incarcerated. So all of these things that normally happen on the outside are still happening on the inside without the necessary protections that I might be able to afford myself on the outside, um, I'm just sort of passing everything on from inmate to inmate and disease often runs pretty rampant inside prisons. So it's a hard environment. And when I'm in a hard environment and I'm stressed out all the time, I tend to age quicker. Inmates who in enter prison very young um, often look young and fresh faced and like they haven't experienced the hardships of life yet. And when they leave a few years later, they look like they've aged overnight. And I always like to compare this to the presidential or the progression of presidential photos rather. Have you ever seen where they have um, day one in office, so and so takes their picture, right? And then a year later they show their the first day of their app of their second year in, in um, office. And it looks like a totally different man, like they've aged 10 years in one year. Um, and that's kind of what this is like. It's the same amount of pressure. It's the same amount of stress. It ages you faster. Um, there's just a sig more significant amounts of gray in my hair. My wrinkles are becoming more pronounced. Um, my immune system is shutting down a little faster. It's not able to keep up with the different things that I'm encountering. So when you're in a high stress environment, even for a short amount of time, you tend to age a lot faster than you would without all of that stress. And this is in part due to the environment in which I find myself, but also in part due to determinate sentencing. So we talked earlier in the semester that under determinate sentencing, 
inmates are serving longer prison sentences and they're serving more of that prison sentence. So basically nobody is going home. And inmates who are not leaving prison for a very long time enter as younger individuals and are now considered elderly men and women who in no way resemble the young person who committed what could be a uh, substantially serious crime in their youth. But their sentence has not expired and parole might not be an option for them, so they are sort of stuck in this environment. Um, and they're aging in prison and essentially we are left paying for it. Inmates who are incarcerated are aging significantly faster than people their own age who are outside of facilities. In prison, inmates are considered elderly by the system itself when they hit 55, rather than the standard of 65 outside of the prison. And the reason they do that is because the environment is so hard and a 55-year-old is basically equatable to a 65-year-old. So you're aging faster, your body is deteriorating faster, um, and you are now experiencing the medical problems and conditions of someone who is a little bit older than you at an earlier age. So that's one, well, that's really the primary reason as to why the threshold is a lot lower for the elderly cutoff in prison. Um, and as you can imagine that as we get older, um, whether we, we are incarcerated or not, a variety of different medical issues are starting to pop up that we've never experienced before in our youth. And prisons now have to figure out a way to treat a variety of different issues, right? So the older we get it, the older we get, we have an increased risk for diabetes, cancer, other illnesses, um, our eyesight starts to go, our hearing starts to go. And these are things that prisons have not had to take into account in prior decades. But we're staying in longer, we're getting elderly, and now we have to account and work into our budget all of these different medical um, things that we have to sort of treat, right? But this is a drain on the budget, this is a drain on personnel resources. However, the, the prison, the correctional system, my job is to keep you alive and keep you healthy. So I have to provide that adequate medical coverage to you. Um, otherwise, it is considered unconstitutional and the prison um, could potentially get sued for it because they're not providing you with the adequate care. So thinking back, we just said um, these are things that we've not necessarily had to deal with in prior decades. Since 1981, um, we have, how do I say this? Since 1981, we have 14 times more elderly inmates than we did in prior decades. So we're, we're getting more elderly people, people are staying in more, that rate is continuously occurring, and we're just having a growing, growing population of elderly inmates. Um, and a lot of these individuals are baby boomers, right? So we have a large generation of people who are continuing to get older. So the same concerns exist for those on the inside as they do for those on the outside. And are prisons prepared to provide enough resources to help them stay healthy relatively as they age? And one of the things that, as we're talking about this, the concern for additional health resources is the amount of money that it takes to keep them incarcerated safely and healthily. Um, so if I'm getting older and I'm going to need dialysis or I'm going to need cancer treatments, the state has to pick up that cost. So what states are having to do is really start providing centralized wings. You can't have elderly people in general population because now they're, they're a security risk, they're at a health risk, maybe they have a specific type of disease that they could pass on to others depending on what it is, right? Um, now you have to figure out what you do with an entire body of 55 year old plus inmates, right? As we get older, I can't climb the stairs as well as I used to. Maybe I'm in a wheelchair. So you can't house that inmate on the second, third, fourth floor, whatever, right? These all, all these inmates have to be moved down to the first floor. Um, otherwise you're gonna have to put in wheelchair ramps because they can't go up the stairs. What if 
you have an inmate that has developed dementia or Alzheimer's. What do you do with that person? Um, they might be very confused as to where they are. Maybe I don't remember how to get back to my cell. I don't remember who the other people are around me. Um, I don't know why I am incarcerated or you know, it's a very confusing thing for them. So what happens when they're not lucid and you're now combating someone who is just very scared and confused about the environment that they are in, right? So correctional officers and staff um, are really having to go through a revitalization in terms of training to have to work with and supervise inmates so they're not harmed, they don't get scared, um, especially in cases where things like dementia are popping up. Um, they're not the same person they used to be when they were younger, and they're just a very frightened older individual who has significant gaps in their memory. How do you deal with that? How do you train your officers to complete that? So one of the things now that states are starting to look into, and some have already started to pass them, is the idea of compassionate release laws. And they're put into effect when an inmate is terminal and is about to pass away. Um, and they're only used in very narrow, um, specific instances. But there are a lot of regulations that states are putting into place in order to make sure that the inmate meets the qualifications for compassionate release um, before they are let out. So, for example, um, here in Texas, we do have compassionate release or what we call medical parole laws. Um, but in Texas, like other states, they only apply when the inmate is terminal and is about ready to pass away. And a medical parole board will be the determining factor as to whether or not the inmate should be released. Um, and that is largely dependent on whether or not that inmate has a support system at home and whether the family is willing to take the inmate in um, and pay for all of the medical care that the inmate might need before he or she passes away. The catch to this is, is that if you are somehow released on medical parole and you take an upswing and you don't end up being as terminal as we originally thought, you're going to come back to prison. We just don't let you out and then you just be an old inmate on the outside, even though technically we probably should. Um, but if you are released and you are not ready to die the way we thought you were, you will come in. So it's not this one shot program and you're out. Um, even though it should be like I just sort of said. Um, but the issue with compassionate release is that it's often very difficult to jump through the hoops that the state needs you to, to jump through to get out. So we have a lot of inmates who are not eligible and are still ending up staying in prison. So the ACLU said we have this growing body of elderly inmates and we need to do something with them. And if we started implementing compassionate release a lot more often, we would end up saving a lot of money. So the ACLU did a cost-benefit analysis examining the impact of compassionate release or medical parole decision-making. And basically what they said is that an elderly inmate who has limited health problems, just general things that are common in your old age, eyesight is going, hearing is going, it's getting harder to walk, um, maybe you have some sort of breathing impairment, just basic general things. If we release those inmates, it would save us roughly 28000 per inmate per year. Releasing an elderly inmate that has more moderate health care problems, um, so now we're talking about things like um, needing dialysis, having cancer, having diabetes, the more intensive types of issues, um, that's going to save the state around 66000 a year per inmate. And then releasing high risk or inmates with higher um, needs and cares based on health issues would save us around $104,000 a year per inmate. Um, and all of those costs are largely associated with the health care that's needed, 
the supervision, having these individuals in specialized wings, um, the training for correctional officers and staff, all of that stuff would save us over $100,000 a year per inmate. So it's a lot of money that we are spending on what is essentially a growing body of inmates who are going to, at some point in time, um, start experiencing these similar health care problems. The downside to this is that even if we were to release these inmates, a lot of people don't have homes to go to. So if I have spent 20, 30 years in prison, um, my family members are more likely to disappear, to break away from me. Maybe they're even passing away because everybody's getting older. Everybody's experiencing health problems. So maybe some of my family has passed away. Um, so if I don't have any support at home, where do I go, right? And as a homeless elderly inmate who has a variety of health care issues, the state is still, still going to have to pick up that bill in some way. Um, so for many, they just choose to stay incarcerated um, and they're not being released for that reason. But unfortunately, what's going to happen is if I stay there, I'm going to die there. And prison is just such a harsh place. And for many, having to die while incarcerated is just such a sad destructive type of thing. Um, if I'm dying in prison because I have no support system, I'm probably going to be buried on prison grounds. I have no money for a private funeral. I have no family members that are willing to take this, this cost or this care on. So it's just, if you think about it, it's just a sad thing. It's so sad for these inmates to be dying in prison and then to be spending their afterlife in buried on prison grounds too. There's just no release from prison ever for some of these individuals. Um, so it's just, it's very sad and very awful. Um, and I don't know how to quite segue into the next topic because incarceration experiences of sex offenders are, are often very awful too. Um, so <laughs> I guess there's no real positive way to spin this or positive way to sort of transition. So we'll just go ahead and jump into the idea of sex offenders in prison because they're experiencing very stressful, traumatic types of incarceration sentences as well. Um, so for sex offenders, they're often considered very hated and some of the most reviled types of offenders within a prison facility. Um, you may be familiar with the prison hierarchy and basically there is a structure or hierarchical, hierarchical structure within prison environments in which prisoners are treated better or worse depending on the crime that they committed to get themselves there. So at the top of the totem pole um, you have killers. Killers are whether it was premeditated or not, um, homicide offenders are typically those who are treated with the most respect and are considered to have done something that is rather notable um, and worthy of respect within inmate culture. And then below them, you have other violent offenders who may not have killed anybody, but still committed a very violent offense. And then you have the drug and property offenders, and below them are the cop killers and the sex offenders. And sex offenders are at the bottom of the totem pole, so to speak, because of the nature of their offense and who specifically they were targeting. So for many male offenders who go to prison, just regular inmates, they are often leaving their families behind, they're leaving their children behind, and in their eyes, they're leaving these individuals, these family members, these loved ones in a vulnerable, unprotected state as the male provider, as the protector, as someone who is very wrapped up into this stereotypical ideal of what a man is supposed to be in terms of the protector and the guardian, I am leaving my family behind and I am leaving them vulnerable and unprotected. And when a sex offender commits a crime, either against an adult female or against a child, many offenders feel like this could have been my girlfriend, this could have been my wife, this could have been my child. I'm not there to protect my family and you're preying on someone who is considered vulnerable and in need of protection. So I'm going to go after you in retaliation regardless of the fact that this was not, that this victim was not anybody that I was even related to. So as a retaliation idea or just as a general 
um, we don't like you, we hate you type of thing, sex offenders are often attacked by other inmates while they are incarcerated. And not just physically, but often sexually in nature too. Um, sex offenders often have one of the highest rated reports of prison rape, and I know that these statistics are not very good because you just don't talk while you're in prison. So even if you are raped, you're very unlikely to report it. But of the rates that we know, sex offenders are very high in terms of those individuals who who are being sexually assaulted um, compared to other inmate groups. So their safety is routinely at risk. And this requires that prison officials routinely put them in um, segregation for their own protection. But while they are segregated, sex offenders are then experiencing high levels of social isolation and they're reporting experiences, especially once they are released, they're, res they're reporting experiences um, in terms of difficulties to gain and maintain social relationships with family members and friends on the outside. And they are self-reporting themselves as loners. They have high feelings of loneliness, social isolation, very common types of experiences among sex offenders themselves. But it's not only with other inmates while they're incarcerated and then their family and friends on the outside, but they often report that they have very strained relationships with correctional officers and they feel like the correctional officers are targeting them more so than other inmates while they're incarcerated. Um, one of the things that, um, in talking about sex offenders, more physical contact types of offenses are being prosecuted at the state level. And then at the federal level, the, um, they're, they're going after more of things like child pornography uh, because of the, the interstate transfer and the wire, um, the internet wiring and all st stuff like that makes it a federal offense. So a lot of child porn offenders are being housed in federal um, prisons. So the Federal Bureau of Prisons, or the FBOP, actually created this thing called the Sex Offender Management Program, or SOMP, and it was created as a solution to many sex offender management issues. Um, of course, this is obviously only applying to federal facilities because it's being structured by the FBOP, um, but SOMP institutions are those that have received a designation, um, meaning that they are a sex offender sex offender friendly, I know that's probably not the right term to use, but a sex offender friendly facility because they have specifically put programs in place that offer um, a lot more treatment, whether that's either residential, excuse me, or non-residential in nature, um, and a higher percentage, and they have to have a higher percentage of sex offenders compared to general population inmates. So in effect, what this basically does is it makes life in a federal prison easier for sex offenders, and it enables them to stay within these facilities without threat to their physical safety or to their lives. But this is only in specific federal um, prisons. And it's sort of, let's see, by doing this specifically, by housing sex offenders all together within certain prisons, it essentially allows the prisons to narrow their resources and it doesn't take as much staff effort to monitor them as effectively because they're not looking for the needle in the haystack kind of thing within general population. Um, but one of the things that the federal government or federal Bureau of Prisons rather is famous for is that they often provide instruction manuals or how-to manuals or what to expect when you go to a federal facility type of thing handbook. And they have a specific one for those that are entering the SOMP prisons for sex offenders. And it talks about what, as a sex offender who's going into a federal facility, what should you expect upon entering in this facility? So I, I don't want to read the entire handbook to you um, because it's quite long and quite goes into a lot of detail, um, but I do want to quote a few excerpts for you um, so that you can see the types of things that I'm talking about and that sex offenders are being exposed to. So the next couple points are taken verbatim from the SO, from the SOP, SOMP manual that the FBOP, a lot of acronyms there, provide to incoming sex offender inmates. So I quote to you guys starting here. 
you may be worried, oh, sorry, and I'm going to read this off the screen, sorry. Um, I have notes that I, I use for lectures, but I'm going to read this verbatim. So I apologize to you guys that I'm just going to be reading, but I want to make sure that I get it all clear for you. So I quote beginning here. You may be worried about being assaulted by other prisoners. If you are at a low security federal prison or an SOMP facility, this will probably not occur. Those who are in low security tend to be preparing to go home and don't want to don't want to risk their release when it comes to time when it comes time for halfway house decisions to be made. At SOMP facilities, there are so many sex offenders, often upwards of 40% of the total population, that the yards are easy and the stigma is significantly reduced. If you are housed at a non-SOMP or medium or high security federal prison, the risk of assault can be much higher, largely due to prison politics. At some easier medium security federal prisons, you might be able to walk the yard and only be ostracized and excluded, but it can be a risky gamble. It is at the high security federal prison level where you will have problems. And that is underlined in this section. It says you will have problems and it's underlined. It would be better to check in, meaning go ask to be put into protective custody, to await transfer to an easier, ideally SOMP yard. Tougher sorts might, be, might opt to fight it out, but this is also a dangerous gamble. If you want to balance your own safety while still taking the SOMP program, feel free to participate in sex offender treatment, but do not admit to new victims or discuss a mental inability to control yourself or to stop yourself from reoffending. It is important to get help, but such, such admissions will put you at a greater risk within the prison. If you fall into this category, seriously consider the residential treatment program, but be careful what you disclose. If you want the judge to re recommend you for an SOMP facility, you must speak to your attorney about a judicial recommendation. He or she should know the procedure at your local U.S. District Court for judicial recommendations. Remember, it isn't easy surviving prison as a sex offender. Your history is what it is. There is no way to hide from it. If others confront you, you can try and t be tough and respond, what's it to you? Or you got some kind of problem? But lying and denying is often not the best way to go because your paperwork can easily be run to determine what you're in prison for. All you can do is strive to be a better man or woman today and to show those around you that you are not what the state not what your charges state, but someone who has grown and turned towards a better path. And that's the end of the section that I want to read to you guys. But this is something that the prison is actually sending to you or giving to you as a way to sort of navigate the future. So could you imagine getting a handbook from an institution you're about to go into and it says, if you go to treatment, keep your mouth shut. Don't talk about any additional victims you might have had. Don't talk about the fact that you can't control yourself. Just go to treatment, keep your head down and try not to get yourself in trouble. Right? This is just absurd to me and crazy that the prison would actually send this to you. Um, but it talks about how difficult life is for an incarcerated sex offender. So it's not much, it's not easy being incarcerated. And once you get out, it doesn't get any easier because then you start the whole registration process and then you might ha have possible residency restrictions and all kinds of stigma stigmatization that comes from your community. And maybe your family members don't want to be around you because you are a sex offender, right? And then you are trying to get a job, but you can't get jobs in places because you are a sex offender and it's so on and so forth. So Either way, as a sex offender, I mean, I hate to put it this bluntly, but you're kind of screwed, right? You're screwed while you're in prison and you're screwed on the outside. And it's just a very difficult thing for a sex offender to f be anything other than a sex offender. Um, and I don't want to keep going on and on about it. Um, I mean, I could. This is this is what I research. This is what I, I am the most passionate about is is the study of sex offenders within this context. Um, and I actually do teach a couple different classes at the undergraduate and graduate level that focus on the topic of sexual offenders. Um, but today I'm going to wrap up so I don't keep you here forever and ever and ever. But I just, yeah, it's tough to be a sex offender. <laughs> so, um, 
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up today and we're going to come back next week and we're going to talk about the idea of parole and reentry for all offender groups. So we're going to take it outside of the prison and put it into the community again and talk about the community correction side of things. So when we come back next week, we're actually going to start the descent of the of the semester and work our way towards the end. There is not much more to go now that we've hit this peak of the semester. Um, so next week, like I said, we're going to enter the community and talk about community corrections, and we'll carry on from there. So um, I thank you guys for your time and your attention today. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I will see you next time when we pick up on the reentry topic. So thanks, guys. I'll see you later. Bye.